So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, uh, wherever you are. Welcome to another uh, online session. Uh, so today's uh, or tonight's session is a little bit different, and uh, it will be uh, more uh, exciting with the uh, Vestra. So the title of the session is Why Including Controversial Topics in Language Learning Promotes Peace and Inclusivity. So you know that language learning or uh, including uh, controversial topics, uh, uh, you know, helps students to talk, to discuss things, etc. So uh, before we get started, uh, I would like to remind the audience that uh, uh, we still have one more uh, webinar uh, this, uh, this month. And uh, also, I would like to remind you that uh, the, uh, the main objective of Everyone Academy is to uh, connect teachers together, to increase uh, online collaboration, and to learn actually from each other. We don't know everything. We need others to uh, teach us to learn from different uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. So tonight, we have Bistra from Bulgaria. She's actually, actually in Italy. And uh, uh, Bistra is really uh, uh, a great teacher, and I'm sure we will learn uh, a lot from her in this, uh, uh, concerning this topic. So welcome to everyone, Academy Bistra. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aziz, for inviting me. It's really an honor and a pleasure for me. And um, hello, good evening, good morning to everybody who is watching us live and everyone who will see the replay. Um, I am going to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Bistra Maugeri. Uh, I was born in Bulgaria, as Aziz mentioned, but I have been living in Italy for almost 10 years. I started teaching in back in 1992, so a long, long time ago, and I only stopped for a year when my son was born. Uh, so that's a, a long experience. I've worked with all kinds of um, ages and levels and degrees of um, instruction. I have worked um, for high school with intensive studies of English for 10 years, so teenagers, then 10 years in a US international school working with children, and then seven years in Italy uh, working mainly for private language schools, exam uh, centers, exam preparation, uh, schools, um, teaching mainly groups preparing for the Cambridge exams. I've also had some um, adult students. And in 2019, I got my Delta. And I thought that this would change everything. Uh, it didn't, actually, because I, um, I got my degree back in 1997 in English philology, got a master's in English philology and what is now known as TESOL. But obviously, it wasn't recognized here in Italy as an Italian degree. So I had to do another one. I got my Delta in 2019. And then in 2020, uh, things turned upside down because of COVID and I was opted out from the school where I worked. Um, I lost my job and uh, like, like so many other teachers uh, during that period. And I decided to use my time in a productive way and continue my professional development. So I enrolled in Scott Thornbury's um, online course on Dogme ELT, where I met fantastic uh, professionals, started building a network of like-minded teachers. And um, then the next year I enrolled uh, on an advanced uh, TBLT course. And as I was doing these two courses, which were actually a, a game changer for me, I thought, you know what? why not start my own thing, my own business, and um, offer an alternative to all those language schools offering nothing but exam preparation? Uh, because I've had learners come to me saying, well, Bistra, I just want to talk in English. I am very interested in this topic or that topic, but all we do is just follow a course book with boring topics and 
I don't like that. I want to be able to talk to people from around the world and discuss deep, meaty, juicy topics, important issues, global issues. And I said, well, I think that's what I want to offer to people, uh, especially adult learners. And so I um, set up my own business and now I'm a freelance teacher, self-employed teacher, uh, working from home, offering one-on-one -on -one courses uh, for adult learners and um, B1 speaking groups and my favorite uh, B2, C1 discussion group courses. And tonight, this is what I'm going to talk to you about, all the benefits from discussing controversial topics in the classroom and how learners um, enjoy that and, and benefit from it. Yes, that, that's great, really. Yeah. So all these, uh, sometimes we meet difficulties and, uh, and challenges in our lives. And they, some people, those challenges make them weak and other people's see them as opportunities as you Absolutely. did. Absolutely, yeah, which, for me. Which, yes, yeah. which is good. Yeah, it was a blessing in disguise, really. I thought it was the end of the world when it happened, but it was really a blessing in disguise. It opened That's new doors for me, new opportunities. So I'm really thankful. That's great. And the Scott's courses are really, really interesting. Yeah, we, amazing. We, we had a session with him like uh, some months ago, and it was really uh, very useful and interesting for, uh, for so many educators. Yeah, it was an eye opener for me as well um, in terms of realizing that there's so much more to teaching than just following a course book. And that if we connect with learners and, and if we are interested in what they are interested in, that that's when actual learning happens, when people are allowed to, um, to talk about things which are relevant to them. So yes, not, when not... people are able to talk and speak because that's the aim or the objective of teaching languages to yeah. speak mm -hmm. and to discuss things. Exactly. I am, I am really, I don't really, uh, you know, grammar is important, but I don't like course books that are solely based on grammar items, on, on uh, you know, on structures, all these mm -hmm. things. Because yeah. uh, the, the purpose, we, we tend to forget the purpose of uh, teaching uh, languages, which is communication. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. You can, uh, Mister. You can uh, start uh, your uh, sharing your presentation, and All right. we, we can uh, respond to comments. And, uh, okay, questions. fantastic. Okay. Can you see my screen? Great. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. I'll make it bigger. Okay. Right, so we need to talk. This is how I, <laughs> how I entitled my presentation because every time we hear that sentence, usually coming from a sup supervisor, if your boss tells you, mm, we talk, you know, the first feeling you get is a feeling of uneasiness. <laughs> what did I do wrong now? What's happening? Uh, and when you talk about controversial topics, this is the same feeling, you feel uncomfortable, but that does not mean you don't have to do it, uh, you shouldn't do it. So um, tonight I'll be looking at uh, three things. So what are controversial topics? Because people have different ideas about controversy. What is controversial in some cultures might be perfectly all right in other cultures. So what is controversy? Um, and then what are the ELT taboos? Because we have our own, <laughs> as English teachers, our own uh, taboo topics. Uh, then why are controversial topics not included in ELT course books? We'll be looking at the reasons. Um, and then why I have included them in my teaching anyway. Uh, finally, and the largest part of the presentation uh, will be about uh, the benefits of including controversial topics in the English language classrooms. So first of all, I would like to ask the audience to get engaged um, by answering these two questions. So what 
is controversy. So I don't know how many people are watching live, but if you could just type in the comments, uh, what is your own definition of controversial? And then maybe give an example of a controversial topic. Like what is it that you feel uncomfortable talking about? Let's see if people will respond. And as they are writing, I'm thinking that actually anything can become controversial. Um, even topics like sport, which are considered very safe to discuss in the classroom, might um, provoke fight <laughs> if if some people in the classroom uh, support one team and uh, the other part support another team that can also be controversial so what is controversial really so uh, we will come up with different people will come up with different answers uh-huh do we do we already have anybody answering Yes, so, so, uh, Omar said it's debatable topics. Yes, absolutely, debatable. Uh huh. Any examples? I can't see the comments, so. Some opinions that could be different uh, at yours regarding forbidden topics. Okay, I like that, forbidden. <laughs> forbidden by whom <laughs> is maybe, my question. Yes, maybe by the teacher or community mm -hmm. yeah okay all right um let me share the dictionary definition of controversial so controversial is an adjective uh coming from the collins dictionary if you describe something or someone as controversial you mean that that they are the subject of intense public argument disagreement or disapproval so you see argument, disagreement, disapproval, or very negative words, um, causing a lot of angry public discussion and disagreement. This is another um, uh, definition by the Oxford Learner's Dictionary. And the origin of the word actually comes from late 16th century Latin. Uh, contra, which means against, and versus, uh, meaning turning. So this is the past participle of the verb turning. So basically controversy or controversial means turning against, which explains our um, previous slide with the fish swimming against the current. So when you are discussing controversial topics, yes, you are going against the current, against the mainstream. Um, okay, the slide cannot change. I don't know why. <laughs> so controversial topics, we have for and against, right? I'm sorry? Uh, we have for and against. For what? I said con in, in controversial topics, we have people for and people against. Ah, yes, yes, absolutely, for and against. Do you have any idea why I cannot change the slide? Okay, so maybe it's stuck. You can you can share and stop sharing and share again. Okay, let's see. I'm sorry about that. Okay, you take up all the time. Yes, we need to be very patient with technology. You can share again. Can you see now? Yes. Okay, let's try again. Okay. Slide number four. Yes. Okay. So, um, synonyms of controversial, if you look at the thesaurus, at the dictionary, uh, you will find the following synonyms uh, polemical, debatable, argumentative, questionable, arguable, contentious, and litigious. So basically, these are topics that lead to people fighting. You see all those negative definitions of controversial. No wonder people are reluctant to talk about uh, controversy. And again, I don't, 
I cannot change the slide. Hmm, this is interesting. Let's see if I. Okay. Uh, do you click on something? No, no, I, I tried to. Um, okay, let's try again with this. Yes, yes, you can do this. No problem. Okay. So maybe if, if I use the. Um, the presentation mode, it cannot change. I'll, I'm trying for the last time. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. No, it brings me back to. Okay. You can you can use the presentation mode, and when it is stuck, you go back to, to this. Okay. It is it, uh, the PowerPoint is controversial also. Yeah, yeah. It just um, it brings me back to to the first slide. So, anyways, I can use um, I can use this. C can you see it? Yes. If I zoom up a little bit. Yes. Okay. So, what are some examples of controversial issues? Um, Mostly these are hotly debated issues like abortion, just the sound of the word causes people to feel very uncomfortable, capital punishment or the death penalty, gay marriage, racial profiling, animal rights, the legalization of marijuana, the legalization of prostitution, gun rights, progressive tax, military interventions, torture, violence against women and children, euthanasia, and then in the past two years, uh, we've seen a lot of controversy surrounding the COVID-19 vaccines. So how do people feel just by hearing these topics? If, if somebody can share in the audience, how, how do these words make you feel? What reactions do they provoke? Do you feel like, oh, <laughs> red light, I should never mention these? Or do you feel like, oh, this is so interesting. I want to talk about it. Yes, uh, Lu Lucia said, not very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that, that's how they make you feel, not very comfortable. Some other big issues um, excluded from the classroom our mental health. This is a huge topic now, especially after um, the COVID pandemic. Aging, nobody wants to talk about people getting old and old people's problems. White supremacy, revisioning of history. We know that history is usually written by the winners. Uh, so entire populations in, in huge groups of people are excluded from history or underrepresented. Uh, so this is also another big issue, revisioning history, especially in light of the Black Lives Matter movement and um, everything that was happening after that. Uh, gender inequality, social inequality and injustice, human rights violation, uh, etc. So I have a question now uh, for the audience. Which of these topics would be considered highly controversial in your country or in your culture? Like which ones would be a no-no? You can never talk about that. That's interesting to find out. Which one is, is a taboo? Yeah, which ones are like a 100% a, a taboo? You will never ever talk about that. Like totally unacceptable in your country. Do we have any answers? Yes, Omar said uh, gay marriage. Okay, yeah, that's a big one. I mean, for the Western culture, it, it's not a big issue. It's not that controversial, but for some cultures, it's a, it's a big red light. Yes, 
Uh, and we have also another answer from Lucia who said uh, vaccination. Oh, yeah. Okay. I wonder how many of you have broken friendships or had huge discussions with friends or relatives, people you know, about the vaccines. Seems like the whole world is divided. Like vaxxers and anti-vaxxers. Maybe mental health is also, mm -hmm. or or maybe mental health problem. We don't often talk about them. yeah depression and uh, right yeah right. This is a big one actually. Um, uh, I hear that a lot lately, um, and seems like the stigma is getting broken little by little people realize that just like when you have a headache you go to the doctor when you have problems with the way you feel you need to also find the right um, professional the right specialist and and heal your soul as well heal your mind not just your body okay um Actually, for those of you who teach academic subjects, those, those of you who are willing to continue your education, further your education and study at a US college or UK college or university, whether you like talking about controversy or not, you will definitely uh, be forced to do that. Um, there's a really nice um, page online, I'm going to add the link later, um, which teaches you, actually prepares um, pre-college students on the official stand um, as, as a guideline uh, about controversial topics in academics. And they have this quote there on the page that college and controversial topics go hand in hand, making it a very, uh, making it a great time to sharpen your debate skills and determine your stance on today's most controversial issues. So there you go. Uh, from the very first paragraph, you have two big benefits. Uh, sharpen your debate skills and determine your stance, deciding what you believe. People don't sometimes don't know what they think. They, they don't really have an opinion on some topics. By the time you graduate, you will likely have been involved in spirited classroom discussions, lively political disagreements, or even full-fledged protests. At some point, you may also have to write about something controversial, such as capital punishment, abortion, or gun control. Exploring topics like these can challenge your worldview. Yes, it can, <laughs> big time. Personal ethics and emotional instincts. This is why I ask people, how do they feel when they hear these, these words, these topics? Most of them make you feel really uncomfortable. So that challenges your emotional instincts. And this will make you a more clear-headed thinker. Because the first step to writing any position paper, and this is what you will be expected to do if you go to US college or uh, university, is to take a stance between two main arguments, which requires you to understand both perspectives, to back up your arguments with cold, hard facts. And this is, uh, in my opinion, what makes the difference, uh, because everybody is free to say whatever they believe, but it's not about throwing your opinion at people's faces, but it's expressing your opinion and justifying it with facts. So this is the good thing about discussing controversy because you check different sources of information and you collect data and you form your opinion based on facts, not based on what you have been taught as a child, what, what your parents have told you, what your pastor has told you, uh, but you check for yourself. You see the other point of view, the other perspective. Okay. So that same uh, page gives you 25 of the most controversial topics that you will face at one point or another if you decide to study at a US college. Uh, and these are gun control, abortion, religious freedom, animal rights, vaccines, privacy rights. This is another huge topic. Um, 
free market capitalism, global climate change, which is now called climate crisis, uh, evolution, marijuana legalization, capital punishment, marriage equality, immigration reform, uh, more needed than ever. The Trump presidency, not anymore, but just any presidency in power. So now it would be the Biden presidency. The opioid crisis is a huge topic in the US. Transgender rights, federal livable wage, white supremacy, the Green New Deal, electoral college, Black Lives Matter, cancel culture, another huge one. A lot of people are talking about that now. Student debt crisis and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, universal health care. So you can find um, a very well-structured position paper guide on that page uh, with further reading links on each of these topics. And if you're a teacher interested in teaching controversial topics, or if you are teaching English to academic students, like university students, I, I highly recommend that page. You can actually build a whole curriculum based on that page, because for each of these topics, they provide a short text, which is like the official opinion about these uh, topics, and then provide further reading from the official press and from um, reputable sources. So really, really good one. Um, okay, moving on with our own controversial topics uh, in the ELT industry. I wonder if people in the audience know what PARSNIP stands for. We have a fancy abbreviation of the taboo topics for English teachers. Parsnip. Mm -hmm. Parsnip, like the vegetable, the vegetable you see on the slide. So what is parsnip? Uh-huh. What is parsnip? Those of you who have taken a CELTA course or a Delta course. Um, you sure do know what that stands for. This is an acronym of the forbidden topics, the topics you will never find in ELT course books. Policy. Uh huh. Politics, yes. Uh, politics. Uh huh. I'm just guessing, but I will wait. Ah, for okay, audience. okay. Do you know what that stands for, is this? No. No, okay. Any wild guesses? What do you think A would be for? Uh, abortion. Could be, could be, yeah. If you said abortion, we will wait for the others. Okay, so it's it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, it is also because it has changed actually, um, but it stands for politics. You guessed right. So politics should not be discussed in the English classroom. Alcohol is a big issue, uh, not an acceptable topic in a lot of cultures. Religion. You always risk stepping on people's toes, ruffling feathers when you talk about religion, sex, of course, narcotics, isms, which is all kinds of ideologies like communism, capitalism, but also feminism and all the other isms and pork. Um, so why do you think these along with some other controversial topics are not included in ELT course books. Why do you think? This is interesting. Yeah. Why do you think CELTA tutors tell you not to touch on these <laughs> when you teach English? Any ideas?
what's wrong with politics, what's wrong with alcohol, religion, sex, narcotics, isms, and pork. Why not? For our white Western culture, none of these is actually a taboo. So how come these are avoided in the English textbooks? Has anybody answered? Uh, because uh, Mayulu said, because we they can cause offense, and uh, because mm -hmm. of the possible difference at extreme uh, extreme opinions from different cultures. I like that extreme opinions. Yes. And, uh, also, there is another uh, comment. They may impose certain ideologies on students. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have ideologies. We have. Uh, extreme opinions we have they may cause up often yes yes very valid reasons actually um what we are told is that these topics could potentially create tension yes make people feel uncomfortable they can result in us versus them attitudes which are very dangerous this is what's happening with the vaccines now um they can lead to conflict and divide the community. They can instill tolerance. And all of these are very, very valid, important reasons. Um, but I would say that they are true only if people are not ready to discuss these topics because you cannot impose that. This is why when you uh, want to teach controversy in the classroom or tackle controversy, First, you need to know your audience. You need to know whether people are open enough to uh, not to accept, but to listen to somebody else's point of view. Okay, because controversy is not about making people change their mind, but it's about debate, discussion, listening. It's mainly listening. People should question their opinions and their beliefs always if they want to grow. Okay. Um, could there be another reason, a hidden one, that these topics are not included in ELT course books? I would argue that yes, there is another reason. And Luke Meddings um, describes that really well for a very good article um, dating back from dating back to 2006. Uh, it's a very nice, very interesting article he wrote for The Guardian about parsnips in the ELT industry and how students should be talking about things which are relevant to them. And he puts it this way, because to be a bankable property in all imaginable earthly territories, it which is the ELT course book, must be homogenized. If you've ever wondered why course books can seem so anodyne, it's because they're designed to be. Sensitivities to potential offense, somebody mentioned in the comments, offense, um, in different territories, rule out whole areas of human experience, including references too, which is why teachers and learners become so familiar with units on travel and the weather. But the truth is that people hardly ever talk about the weather. Uh, they want to talk about these deep subjects, um, these issues, global issues. So basically, if you want to sell to more people, keep it generic, avoid confrontation. So there's a financial reason behind that. It's not that teachers don't want to talk about this. It's not that learners don't want to talk about this, but there is a risk, okay? And when there is a risk, you cannot sell. So um, trying to please everybody in order to sell to more people. That is one reason why these are not included in the classroom. Um, I would like to share now why I have decided to include these topics. 
in my teaching, uh, basically because people talk about them in their language anyway. So why not learn to express the same ideas in English? Very logical, right? And then my second reason is a bit more selfish. Um, I already mentioned that I was born in Bulgaria back in 1973 when Bulgaria was still a communist country, part of the ex-Soviet uh, Union bloc. And I used to live under an oppressive propaganda-driven regime, which limited people's freedom of speech, freedom of movement, access to information. Uh, perhaps you've heard about the Iron Curtain that separated the, the communist bloc from the rest of the world. Um, and the right to protest was also limited. So no, absolutely no um, kind of dissent was allowed. So I know firsthand the detrimental effects of living in constant fear that you may be punished for standing out. Why? Because I still remember as I was growing up, my father used to listen to an illegal radio station every evening called uh, Radio Free Europe. And I remember my grandfather was, was telling him, you're going to get in trouble. Like one of these days, they're going to get you. You will disappear. Because this is what was happening to people who were against the communist regime, against the, the, the communist government. Anybody who had a different opinion um, could disappear uh, just completely. Nobody knew anything uh, about that person anymore. So... I was fascinated by, by all that, uh, that there, there is another world behind the Iron Curtain. I could hear the people in that radio station talking against the communist regime and how oppressive it was and, and um, how people were locked and, and their um, human rights were violated. And later, when I was a teenager and in 1989, uh, there was the fall of the Berlin Wall and um, Gorbachev's perestroika and communism governments started falling down one after another. And we were all out in the streets protesting, wanting freedom, wanting democracy. So it felt to me that I was living a second life as if I was reborn. Finally, I was free to speak my mind. Finally, I was free to to get out of the country, visit other countries, see other people, uh, listen to other opinions. And uh, for me, this was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. So I know what it's like to be limited, um, censored, not to be able to speak your mind. So I don't want people to feel the same way with their English. Um, I strongly believe in freedom of speech. If people are censored and lack the freedom to express their opinion without fear of punishment, they are robbed of the opportunity to connect with the rest of the world. This is what happened during communism and still happening um, with a lot of regimes around the world, uh, non-democratic. People live in a dangerous bubble if they only hear one opinion. Uh, their own limited world of confirmation bias, and they're stuck with limiting beliefs and lack of any critical constructive thought. There's nothing more dangerous than living only with, with one idea, only with one point of view, and, and never being open to other points of view. That stops growth. Uh, and, and when I say freedom of speech, um, I don't mean malicious, hateful statements or calumny or defamation. That's not freedom of speech. I mean, being able to express your opinion in a respectful way, um, in a respectful manner, not uh, denigrating people, not offending people, but just being free to speak your mind. Okay. Um, violent extremism is born from people's inability to tolerate differences. This is what I believe. Um, this is what makes people go into a newsroom and kill 13 journalists just because they had a different opinion. Okay, 
So if, if people do not tolerate diversity of opinion, that leads to extremism because they, they feel that, you know, that's the only way. And, and everybody who thinks differently is, is less worthy of a person. Limiting people's freedom of expression is a violation of human rights, as simple as that. And finally, when entire communities and countries are divided because of their difference of opinion, dictators take advantage. So it's, it's the ancient rule of um, uh, divide and conquer. They fuel more hatred, more fear, so that they can rule more easily. So this is what happens when people are against other people and there's no real communication, but it's us against them. So this is very, very dangerous. Um, I like this quote by C. Joy Bell. She's a modern day author, um, philosopher, essayist, often quoted. She says that it is when we think we can act like God that all respect is lost. And I think this is the downfall of peace. We lie if we say we do not see color and culture and difference. We fool ourselves and cheat ourselves when we say that all of us are the same. We should not want to be the same as others and we should not want others to be the same as us. Rather, we ought to glory and shine in all our differences, flaunting them fabulously for all to see. It is never a conformity that we need. We need not to conform. What we need is to burst out into all these beautiful colors. So controversy allows for diversity. And this is just in itself a huge reason why we should allow controversy in the classroom. So what are the benefits of including controversial topics in the classroom? I would like to ask the audience again to collaborate and share their ideas why controversy could actually be beneficial for people except for the reasons we already mentioned. So what are the benefits of including mm -hmm. controversial topics yes. in, the, in the classroom? Mm -hmm. So why would that benefit learners? So benefits here are associated with their language development, etc. Right? Just just all kinds of benefits. Yes, linguistic benefits, um, um, socio-cultural benefits. Okay, so um, there is a comment here that. Uh, the people uh, have their own opinion and they are not afraid uh, to express themselves. Right. There, is lack, there is lack of fear. Very good. I love that. I love and, that. And also uh, it motivates students to participate. Another comment. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I'm thinking of a classroom full of um, various ethnic, racial backgrounds, uh, but only one point of view, like the majority only making decisions and um, nobody allowing for the other people to take part in conversations in decision making. So when people are, okay, let me share my next slide. Uh, so freedom of expression, yes, that guarantees inclusion and equal opportunities. Everyone feels valued and people are not afraid, as uh, somebody from the audience mentioned. So that is a huge benefit, just creating a, a friendly, safe environment for learners to, to speak up their mind, to not be afraid to say what they think. So equal opportunities and inclusion. 
People are exposed to a plurality of ideas and identities, which makes it easier for them to accept and appreciate diversity. If you never see diversity, you will not tolerate it when you see it. But if you see it all the time, it will be perfectly normal for you. I know in um, Sofia, for example, the capital of Bulgaria, we have four different churches, uh, big temples for the four main religions uh, within walking distance. So we have a huge Orthodox um, cathedral, uh, Alexander Nevsky, then just five minutes walk from there. We have a, a big mosque and then we have um, uh, the synagogue and the Catholic church. So in the very center of the capital, we have four main religions coexisting and nobody's pointing fingers and nobody is um, you know saying oh you are not like me just people live in peace and harmony because they see diversity they see people who are different from them and they coexist peacefully so it just makes it normal when you when you allow for diversity it becomes normal to live with other people and not be afraid of them um, Having been exposed to various cultures and belief systems makes you more tolerant, more empathetic. You no longer fear people who are different from you. Peace is possible when people respect each other despite their differences. Because what happens now, for example, with the immigration crisis, these are all different people coming from a different culture and we don't see them as human beings we just see them as someone different if we allow people you know who are fleeing from from wars and conflicts and famine into our culture and give them equal opportunities and allow them to to express themselves um it will be very easy to coexist because these are all good people. They're, they have um, their families, they have their degrees. A lot of them are very well-educated people. Uh, but just fearing these people and thinking that they're someone different is like labeling them. They are the immigrants. So they're not a, a, a a person, they are an immigrant, a label. It's very easy to get angry at a label. It's very easy to, uh, to blame a label. But if you allow people, then you see people, you don't see differences. So peace is possible when we allow that, that plurality of identities in um, our countries. A huge benefit uh, for learners in terms of their opportunities in the corporate world, in, in a future career. It makes you a more competitive member of the international workforce, especially in higher paying fields like finance and politics, federal government, corporate law, etc. If you are after a position as a corporate executive, for example, Know that a lot of companies now include questions about your attitude towards diversity in their interviews. And I remember a teacher shared with me the other day about um, a student who was preparing for a job interview in English. And um, she studied about all those tricky questions and she learned everything, how to talk about herself and her past experience. But they actually asked her about her point of view on abortion and she's like nobody has ever taught me how to talk about these things I, I I knew nothing about abortion I didn't know what to say so basically including converse um controversial topics and and these kinds of conversations in the the English classroom prepares people for for their future jobs because these will come up at interviews especially if you are applying for a, a higher position so you better be prepared. Um, diversity and inclusivity allow for a much bigger talent pool. Of course, if you have people from uh, various backgrounds, they will bring the best of their world. So you have a higher, a, a bigger pool of talent, uh, therefore new perspectives, 
more creativity, innovation, just think of Silicon Valley. They don't care about where you were born. They don't care about your race, about your religion. They just want your talent. They want you, your ideas. So consequently, that makes up for better decision making, uh, which leads to increased performance and higher profits for companies, for communities. So it's a win-win for everybody if we allow for diversity of ideas and opinions. What about um, other benefits? Uh, for example, you see these three girls there in the picture, break the silence and the violence. So that stimulates um, learners to become activists, to take action. By tackling controversial issues in class, students learn about topics which are not only relevant to their lives, but also the lives of millions of people around the globe. And this is why we learn English, don't we? To connect with people from around the globe. English is an instrument, a tool uh, to connect people. So if you exclude controversy, you cannot connect with people. That's just logical. Uh, but if you do, that deepens students' understanding of complex issues and they explore diverse perspectives. And by doing this, they inevitably develop critical thinking. Students are better informed, more socially and politically engaged, and they learn to recognize injustice and take action against it. So it's not just my world, I'm fine, I don't care about what's happening uh, in the rest of the world, but okay, let's see what, what can be done. This is a huge social injustice, what can I do? So it actually promotes um, that kind of being an active global citizen in learners. And of course, there are linguistic benefits. Um, while comparing different points of view, students will be working with large amounts of data in all mediums, texts, video, audio. So when you are uh, researching about a topic, you are cross-reading uh, from various sources of information. You're listening to podcasts, you're watching the news, you're reading commentaries. So all that exposure to high level English, advanced English, uh, makes it you know, easy for you to analyze and form conclusions. Uh, this is a very impressive skill to have, uh, beneficial in various professions, for example, lawyers, psychologists, um, sociologists, forensic scientists, data analysts. So whenever you are working with various texts, not just the text from your uh, course book, but you look into lots of sources of information, inevitably, um, your language improves because you see all those structures, you expand your vocabulary, uh, learners are able to spot the right terms for the specific topics in authentic texts, and they develop lexical precision. So this can be really useful for exams, um, knowing all those terms to talk about various topics. They will notice lexical and grammatical patterns, which will improve their accuracy. So a lot of this high quality input. Um, if you are preparing for academic exams, that will that this will lead to higher reading and listening comprehension, higher scores in language proficiency exams, higher academic performance in college, um, improved communication skills as learners develop the confidence to create the right balance of empathy and impartiality in conversations. So that stimulates um, the development of communicative skills and critical thinking. And last but not least, if there are any teachers out there in the audience or anybody watching 
who feels like, yes, that's what I want to include in my classes. Uh, I'm going to talk about diversity and inclusivity. Um, I have a few tips for you uh, before you approach controversial topics in class. So number one, know your audience, as I mentioned already. Make sure that the people in the classroom are open-minded and willing to talk about these topics. Maybe you can conduct a little research, a little survey and see which topics would be a no-no, which they might be more open to tackle in class. So know your people. Of course, if you work for a state school or a private language school, consult your supervisors. This is essential. Make sure that what you say and what you do is not against the school policy. Otherwise, not only will you get in trouble and lose your job, but you might get your school in trouble. So check with your school, check with the policy before you approach any controversial topic. Uh, Cross-read through various sources before presenting a topic or an opinion. We have so much information online, so much fake information as well. So make sure that um, you not only take what Wikipedia tells you, but go deeper, delve into the topic and, and check various sources. Uh, verify authenticity and credibility of your sources before you recommend any websites, any pages or books or videos, just make sure that what you are recommending can be backed with data, back, backed with facts. And I think we have come to the end of the presentation. <laughs> that is all for me, uh, from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your participation, those people in the audience who are um, typing their answers, their comments. Um, can I get out of the presentation mode now? And if people have questions, I will be more than happy. Yes, sure. OK, shall I stop? the presentation now stop sharing yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay all right i hope we are within the time limits i i enjoy it every uh, every slide of your presentation it's oh. really very useful uh, yes i thank you so much i feel that we need a course book based only on controversial topics because it's really helpful. It's, it it's, is. Uh, it serves every purpose we can imagine. It serves uh, language acquisition. It, it, it serves uh, critical thinking, creativity. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we are, we are preparing uh, students for a world full of conflict. So, so uh, you know, if we don't uh, uh, teach them how to deal with different uh, people, people that are different from them in terms of religion, in terms of race, etc. So we will really get into more problems and conflict. Absolutely, absolutely. You said so this is really so well. beautiful. Thank you. Yes, I, I believe it's um, of, of utmost importance for people to learn how to communicate. I mean, the world is divided enough. We, we need to start building bridges and not fight over differences because honestly a lot of times differences don't even matter when people start talking about them uh, when you see the person you don't see the ideology but you see the person and you are open just to listen really this is like the least thing we can do is just listen because sometimes we just have our our mental blocks immediately. As, as we hear something that is different from our own belief, belief system, we just shut down, we, we block. We don't even listen. Yes, this is, this, is, this is really interesting. And it reminded me of the, there is a, there is a certain pyramid, uh, the hierarchy of uh, disagreements. Mm -hmm. So at the very bottom, uh, there is name calling. So uh, 
uh, people tend to use uh, abusive language uh, to invoke uh, fear in their opponents. Yeah. But uh, on the top of the pyramids, we have like uh, you. If you disagree with somebody, you kind of point out the flaw, mm -hmm. and in his argument, and you listen to him. You don't, you don't attack him. You listen to him. But sometimes uh, uh, people listen to respond. Exactly. They don't, they don't listen to understand what you are saying. They just listen to, to respond. Good point. Which is, which is really that. Yeah. Yeah. So these can be very useful, like teaching students to not only to express their opinion, but to listen and to, to reach out to the other person, to really connect. Uh, because you don't have to change your mind. I mean, you, you can still hold on to your belief, but just the just questioning your beliefs from time to time. Because you, you, yes, uh, uh, you, you you said in your presentation that uh, uh, some people uh, you know attack others who are different uh, from them, but if they are used to uh, inclusivity. They, they, they kind of find this uh, normal. You mentioned the example yeah. of the, the mosque, the church, mm -hmm. and the synagogue. Yes. Uh, I... Yes. Sorry, sorry, the, go the, ahead. The, uh, the, this is really a very good example. And we can also minimize so many uh, unnecessary conflicts and problems in the world yeah. if, we, if we apply this. Because we can't imagine the world uh, uh, you know, not different because it will be boring to see, for example, the same culture, the same music, yes. the same people. It will be very boring. But yeah, if people are different from you, it's 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 good. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Not not only is it boring, but it's actually dangerous. It's dangerous because you live in a bubble and you are not open to new ideas and new perspectives, and and you can get stuck. People get stuck when there are no new perspectives. It's just the same old story, the same old stuff. But if you allow a diversity of, of ideas, plurality of ideas, there's progress. Yes. Uh, do you have any quick advice before we close the session for teachers who would like to implement this, uh, this concept of controversy in their classrooms? And at the same time, like, uh, uh, manage the classroom because when we raise these topics uh, sometimes yeah. students get very excited and uh, they want to respond and they, they might get into clashes yes Do you have any maybe uh, tips for teachers uh, yes yes you are right it can get out of control very quickly and easily so probably my tip number one is, as I mentioned in my last slide was know your audience just don't don't do that with people you don't know uh, perhaps build report first and and listen to people see if they're open maybe uh, carry out the survey uh, see how they respond and if, if they're still not open I wouldn't force that on on them but if we're talking about adult people who are socially awake socially aware and and they want to talk about these things they're interested they are active they read the news they um, care about what's what's happening um, in the world, then probably this would be the ideal audience. <laughs> um, so yeah, know, know your people, know your students and see how open they are to discuss controversy and which topics exactly. Yes, uh, there is a, a comment from Elena. Mm -hmm. She said that the problem is often that the people are not hearing you even when they are listening. This is a very difficult skill to acquire. And also to teach to teach the students, we uh, we are like uh, more centered on ourselves. We mm -hmm. we love people to listen to us, but uh, when we talk, we when other people talk, we uh, kind of prepare our answers. It's like <laughs> it's, it's like a conflict. Yes, that's true. But, but listening really is very powerful. It is. If we master the skill of listening and listening truthfully, not so, so fake listening, mm -hmm. just 
just not in your head and yeah. listening, listening to understand, listening to, uh, you know, to, uh, to find a solution, not mm -hmm. just listening mm -hmm. uh, in a thick way. Yes, I would add also asking the right questions. Because sometimes yes. people have an opinion, but they cannot explain why they feel this way. They're like, oh, because I believe so. And very often our, our mindset comes from the culture where we were brought up. Uh, so we need to, yes, listen and ask questions. And, and first of all, question our own beliefs. And the, the real growth comes when you are ready to change your opinion, when you're ready to unlearn things that you have learned throughout your life. Yes, you move, you move a little bit out of your comfort zone. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. Yeah, this because you have, we... you have to admit that you, you have been wrong or maybe not entirely right. Yes. Yeah. That's great. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Vistra. This is really a uh, very uh, useful uh, presentation. Thank you, Is this? It you are an expert in this. Uh, well, uh, an expert, no, I don't think so. This was entirely based on empirical um, experience because it's but just I feel my way that of- you invested, uh, there is some, something there that tells that you, uh, that you experienced these things. It's life, life experiences, it is yeah. not- just something you read about or absolutely absolutely also because i've seen everything as i said everything in the elt industry i've i've taught children as young as three years old and adults as old as like 60 something 70 so all ages all backgrounds um all types of english i've taught academic english and exam english general business just whatever <laughs> uh, there is out there and this is what I'm passionate about. I, I want to give people an alternative to, to speak their mind and to talk about what really matters for them. So yes. this is what, what drives me. <laughs> That's great. So uh, thank you so much for this great uh, thank presentation. You. Thank and you. And before we close the session, do you have any comments, any tips, quick tips, any suggestions? Someone, someone you would like to thank in the audience. Uh, well, a quick, a quick message to your, to one of your friends or something. Yes, I, I would like to uh, say a huge thank you to everybody who was here with us tonight and participated uh, in the live, and then everybody who will watch the replay later. Thank you so much, Aziz. It's an honor. Uh, to be a guest and uh, I can just encourage people to to listen as you said Let, let's yes. wrap it up with this listen yes listen yes. just listen thank you. Thank, there's thank a lot so more much, than, than you and your your thoughts and your beliefs uh, yes uh, maybe that's why we have two years <laughs> yes the world is bigger than what we think it is um, yes so, so thank you so much, uh, Bistra, and uh, thank you. Be, uh, see you, see you later. Okay. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye. Bye.